kids in combat, kids being shot at. The first thing we would call in a firefight would be an OE-10 Bronco. They knew we would come, we would be there. Roger, Igor's Airborne 76 Julian, 1445 We would make life and death decisions. It was the starting point. Without it, you could not survive. What did I think about the OV-10? Uh, it was one of the larger disappointments of my military career. It was not the sexy aircraft. It was not the big fighter aircraft. It wasn't supersonic. It didn't go at high altitudes. It couldn't fly from here to Moscow and back without refueling and that. All of my time through flight school, I had been, like everybody else, wanting to get into F-4s and be a fighter pilot. And that was everybody's aspiration. In fact, uh, when I, when I got my wings, my verbal orders were to uh, F-4s uh, at uh, El Toro in California, which was every young boy's dream was to be a fighter pilot in Southern California. Uh, normally, two weeks after you got your verbal orders, you got your written orders. And my written orders came into something called VMO2 at Camp Pendleton. All I knew about Camp Pendleton is that's where the ground pounders were. I didn't know that they had any airplanes there at all, and I certainly didn't know what a VMO2 was. And so I called out to the squadron and said, somebody tells me there's a rumor that uh, they have OV-10 Broncos at, uh, at VMO2. And the guy just laughed and said, yep, the rumors are 100% true and that's all we have. And I went, thanks. And then started looking in the books as to what an OV-10 Bronco was. And it was like you went from being, assuming that you were going to be a fighter pilot going twice the speed of sound to being a green airplane at a, at a ground pounder's base flying a propeller-driven airplane, and it was kind of like, oh, my God. I was always interested in the OV-10, again, for the same reason that some other people didn't like it. It was not fast. It was not a big, hot jet. It was a small aircraft that had propellers on it, and I'd always, I'd always loved Corsairs. There's something about every airplane that you like, and I started to realize that the role of the OV-10 was, uh, was very dynamic, and you could go out and fly the airplane every day for a month and do a different mission with the airplane. And so you, it's something that really kind of grew on you, even though, that, as I've said before, we were kind of the bastard children of the military group, but when it came time to communicate or they needed help, they always wanted to call for the OV-10. Putting light parts together is uh, kind of like also known as inventorying. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. All of these parts and pieces, and now we have to find out where they go. We don't have any instructions. It's all in our head trying to figure it out. Yeah. There's literally miles and miles of wires in any airplane. And we have to get it back together. These are the attach bolts, OK? These are bolts, you can see they're all in pretty rough shape. But these attach the boom to the wing. I have to clean them up, get all these lugs ready for the bolts to go in when we do the reassembly. We first met in the squadron in 49 in Cherry Point, North Carolina, in a fighter squadron flying Corsairs. I was a, the new guy in the squadron and he decided that uh, I should learn to be a fighter pilot. And of course, I'd been through flight training and I thought I was a fighter pilot. But then he whipped my backside so consistently with that Corsair that I realized I had something to learn. At that time, KP was building a little racing airplane 
I was, quote, helping him. <laughs> that was my plan for the future. I was going to make a lot of money racing, and uh, <laughs> then eventually I'd get married. <laughs> Matter of fact, I ran into a young lady, and I explained that to her, and she didn't believe it. <laughs> Why? Beckett had an idea. He'd flown Corsairs previously, uh, single-engine fighters in Korea, and was concerned with the way that the Marine Corps and the Air Force had been going, primarily in not providing enough support for the ground troops, uh, close air support missions. He knew that the problem with jets, because he had flown jets and he had flown uh, uh, prop fighters, the problem with them was it was very difficult for them to spot a fleeing target on the ground. Now, I'd just come back from Korea and the jets were coming out now. And uh, I'd been an old prop pilot, but I also checked out in jets. And uh, it was very obvious to me that while the jets went real fast and they were real nice, they couldn't do the job. His idea was to come up with a concept or an idea of something that could provide support for the commander on the ground and provide close support for him without having to have fast airplanes and things of that type. We were on Bill's patio one day. We used to get together and just debate. If he said up, I'd say down, and we'd go on from there for a couple hours. Bill said we were going to run out of capability to do truly discriminatory close air support. I said, well, why don't we build one? So they decided they would build this project in their garage, and they scrounged money for it and started building this very light aircraft. Uh, maximum weight on it was about 6,000 pounds. Uh, the empty weight was closer to about 2,500 to 3,000 pounds. While they were working on it, they continued to move their project, uh, hit some roadblocks along the way that were presented by the, by the, sort of the powers to be in Washington with the Naval Air Systems Command. And Naval Air Systems Command attitude was, if we didn't plan it and we didn't tell you to build it, it can't be built. What we were trying to do is change the R&D process. You just can't get your arms around the R&D system and get it anywhere near an operator. They build whatever they think you need, and usually it turns out to be tolerable. The Navy was trying to kill the program, and uh, they had every plan in the world of destroying the program before it got started. A little bit of background, you have to think that uh, it was uh, not too long after World War II. He, jets had come along, the atom bomb, the Air Force was going, it was a brand new uh, separate Air Force and very powerful. And the Navy, in order to even stay in existence, had to make jet bombers on the carrier to carry nukes. So there's an awful lot of politics in the game, just as background. And then they put the jets in the work in Korea, and even though they didn't do so well, that was the most modern things. And they were more interested in the political survival in a lot of ways than they were in actually doing the job. I mean, that gives them some excuse anyway, but, but that's a little of the background in there. But the other thing is that the system doesn't really uh, get back down to the people that are using it at all. In addition to my experience in Korea and having a feel for what you could do and you couldn't do with a jet, I was interested in tactics and so forth. And one of the books that we got, and KP passed a lot of them around the Pentagon, was a, a book by a German Stuka pilot named Rudel. He flew 2,500 missions on the Russian front <laughs> in the dive bombers. And he used to dive bomb going straight down at 1,000 feet. That's getting real close. But in the end of his book, because he had so much experience, he was interviewed by uh, the LIs. And uh, his comment was that they weren't really interested in learning the lesson. If you wanted to do something, you had to do it outside the system. So finally, KP suggests, well, let's do it. We're going to build an airplane that was back to fundamentals, very simple, and it would operate in the forward area, take off, fly a mission in 10 minutes or less, come back and land. Beckett and uh, Rice also had talked to a number of the aircraft companies to try to get their support. They had also talked to some of the ground marines down at Camp Pendleton and that and talked to them. Got a lot of support from them. They realized that when they were presented with this concept of something they would have in the field, they would be available immediately for support uh, using their own type of weapons, the machine guns they used, 
they envisioned it using uh, mortar rounds, 4.2 inch mortar rounds as bombs. Uh, they also envisioned a, using a 106 millimeter recoilless rifle mounted underneath the fuselage of this aircraft that they were going to have. And everything would be completely supported from the field. First idea to get close to the troops was land in an open field or something like the old biplanes used to do. But the thought occurred to us that you could land on a road, you could go even places where helicopters couldn't go. When I was on Okinawa in World War II, I noticed that the Grumman TBM, TBFs, got a utilization that was about three times as much as any of the other fighter bombers there. And so I was sort of curious, and it was because they had a bomb bay. And they, they used that to drop food to the troops. They dropped Coke bottles over enemy territory to make a whistle like a bomb and so forth and keep them away at night and then every so often drop a bomb. They carried depth charges. They carried sauna boys. They had all different kinds of missions that they hadn't thought about when they designed the airplane, but that they did have in there. And so I figured that you could get that kind of flexibility if you had some kind of a little bomb bay. They also had the concept uh, of about 500 shaft horsepower turboprop engines, and they were going to use this on the aircraft. Could run on multi fuel, you could use aviation gas, you could use jet fuel, you could use gasoline in it. Just it would run on anything. I mean, that would be available out in the field to the troops that were in the field. The way his design was doing, we could have done all of these things, <laughs> and it would have worked. And the idea was it would be a small aircraft that could be used for various missions that the large fighter aircraft would not be able to handle and do a, and do a better job on them also. Also, it would be a very a relatively inexpensive aircraft uh, compared to what was around in those days and uh, even more expensive today, of course. At one point, I was asked to brief the assistant secretaries of the various armed forces for R&D. And if you can imagine trying to tell them this story, <laughs> that had come from industries, and, and I had a chart, it wasn't any wider than that, and it had 27 characteristics that an airplane had to have to meet our requirements. <laughs> I, I, sat, I stood up in front of them and I said, and then there's this point, and then there's that point, and when I got through they were all sound asleep. <laughs> Dr. Wakelin, who was the uh, Navy uh, uh, Assistant Secretary for R&D, he asked me to come up and see him, and I went up there and he said, KP, I can get you an airplane built, but it isn't gonna look like you want it to look at all. He said, it's gonna be almost unrecognizable to you. And uh, when we finally got through, it was still recognizable, <laughs> but that would that had taken Two years of battling with the Navy to get it uh, to get it to come out right, and uh, it was it was a real war all the time because they, their goal was to get the program canceled, and once they had set their heart to canceling it, they lose track of the reason they did that, and they just all fight to to cancel. But uh, that was that was the way that went. For the aviators, it's always fun for them to see what actually holds their airplane together because they don't, they don't realize that when they jump in it and go fly, because you see 10,000 rivets and you think, oh, that's what holds it together, but this is what actually, when you get down to it. All right, Joe's of you with a weak neck and a strong mind, let's go. Which way left? As important. Whoa! Pretty close. How much more further, guys? Uh, two inches. We're trying to get the brackets, all of the different, the four brackets between the boom and the wing lined up. And uh, we're working with, you know, this is this is kind of like combat maintenance because we're working with uh, with hand tools and dollies and uh, on uneven ground. So uh, this is this is critical though to getting the boom matched up with the wing. It almost looks like the boom needs to go up. Okay, wiggle that wing a little bit. That's too low now. This bolt was junk anyway, it was all beat out. And we're making like a bullet for it so it'll pass through to help align that little bit that we're off. Hopefully this will work. If it doesn't, we'll play with something else. Put the bolt in and just tap it on that thing and yeah. sometimes it'll find itself home. 
would move in the wing. Never mind. It's already in. Never mind. How? Don't force it. Get out of your hair. Okay, on your inboard one. On your inboard one, pull it out. Yeah, it's going. It's going. Go, keep moving. Come on, John. Come on. Bring it in. It's coming in. It. Come on, shake. Let's go. She's in. She's through. That's it. All right. Oh, Nothing to it. Outstanding. <laughs> when the OV-10 was developed under the contract, it actually became a much larger aircraft uh, with a lot more equipment on it than what was originally intended. They kept adding requirements as uh, it was, went through the system, and the Navy made us put a landing gear on there that was supposedly for rough fields. Well, they designed a special runway with sine wave bumps in it, and the best pickup truck could only do something like seven miles an hour on it before it went completely out of control. And the OV-10 was supposed to land and take off on that. And they could, and the plane could do it, but the pilot couldn't. The pilot's eyes hit resonance and stuff like that. But uh, that's what the Navy did to it, and that added about a thousand pounds that was essentially useless. They never used it. The uh, other thing was the Air Force, they added in about a thousand pounds of radio. And, you know, this is a close-in support airplane and can talk to the United States from Vietnam. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they added all of this radio in to add another thousand pounds and, you know, kill it. And again, the, the pilots reverse that. The pilots have a tendency to uh, make the thing work, whereas the technology people in the SISCOM were trying to not make it work. And uh, it was an interesting contest, and I think the pilots did better than they did. <laughs> in the long run, they made it a success, and, said it, and both the Navy and the Air Force wanted to kill it. When the concept came in and more radios were added and the Air Force decided all they wanted to have it for was as a forward air control aircraft as opposed to the concept they had come up with, which was an observation aircraft, forward air control, artillery spotting. A helicopter escort was also a, a main mission that they looked at at the time. We were kind of frustrated, but we realized it would still be a pretty useful airplane because it had wonderful slow speed characteristics. You, you, you could fly the airplane without paying attention to flying the airplane. I looked at it from the standpoint that we started off with one concept, didn't get it, we got a different airplane, and so instead of making the airplane to meet the concept, now my job was to make the concept to meet the airplane. With this equipment, you could do a lot, so uh, you had to change it. It was a totally different idea, but it still worked. The uh, Air Force and the Navy really wasn't that much interested in it. The uh, Army thought this was a pretty good idea. An Army colonel had come around looking for them, had heard about their project. And in this meeting, the Army had said, well, yes, we'd, uh, you know, Air Force said, we don't need any aircraft of this type. They don't fit into our scheme of things. The Army said, well, we'd probably take 100. And the Marine Corps said, well, we could use 75 of these. They would work, you know, for our mission. And at that point, the uh, Air Force representative spoke up again and said, well, if the Army's going to get 100, we need 200 of those. Again, the inter-service rivalries uh, were, were present even at that time. It's really interesting to read the original paper and just to take a look at what they attempted to do and how it was perverted, gives you an idea of how things end up the way they are sometimes with government, uh, with different people have different ideas and what they want to do with something, and that may not always mesh with what's best for the people that, that really need the support. It may not be what's best for the ground troops, but it's best for somebody else. But they're both very interesting papers that talk about the concept, how the concept was changed around, why the changes were made. Uh, also some comments on maybe why they weren't the best choices in making those changes. And in fact, back to even today, I, I would recommend reading uh, people to go back and take a look at those concepts and think of what we might be involved in in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. If we had aircraft or, or vehicles available of the type of things that, that Rice and Beckett envisioned in 1960. The airplane was cool because it was small. It wasn't big and not a fast mover. One guy 
One 18-year-old could do everything. The whole airplane could be mine. I could fuel it. I could change the oil. I could do the tires. Do everything. It's not like a B-52 that it takes a crew of 40 to go out and do that kind of job. You could do it by yourself. Having been involved in helicopters and flying FAC missions and medevac missions and gunship missions, it took a tremendous amount of uh, concentration just to fly the aircraft. With the OV-10, the flying, once you've got it mastered, it flew uh, like an extension of your own limbs. We did a lot of uh, work with the SEAL teams. In fact, basically every SEAL mission, we would have a couple airplanes attached to them, and they got into some very, very tight quarters uh, that uh, they, in fact, the one, the one day the, uh, the guy is, uh, is talking, he popped a smoke and he said, you need to put the ordinance to the, by the smoke. And I says, well, where do you want to put the ordinance to the smoke? He says, well, put it on the smoke. And I says, well, where is, where is the smoke? And he goes, it's in my left hand, shoot to the right. So, yeah, it was, the SEALs got, uh, we work very close with the SEALs. Yep. Yeah. Made it. <laughs> there was one minor, minor deal deal, Larry. Right? How you doing? Good. Hey, good to see you again, man. This is Tom uh, Combs. Tommy Tom Combs. Right. We called him Hawk. Back then, he was quite a bit skinnier, <laughs> and his snod stuck out. You look normal now, man. <laughs> That's 426. You know, I've never seen one up close. Oh, yeah. uh, other, other than that, the closest I ever saw an AO was that day me and you were together in the Quaisons. I can tell you, that plane was just right <laughs> down. I mean, it, when well, it was, I'd say Mark Mark, and you'd say Tally Ho when yeah. Yeah, you, you found a team. Yeah. But, but he was flying just, I mean, it looked like about 15 foot off the ground when he went between me and that tree line where all them hooches were, man, he just swooped on out. 30 years after the fact, you meet somebody that could give you that. Bird's eye view. Well, the bird's eye view of what we're doing on ground. parts of it. Looks like somebody's floating with this one. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the biggest one. This is the Charlie Ridge, yeah. West Charlie Ridge area. Thirty-something years later, you look and see what you did that one day. Yep. Boy, that was that was a hell of a firefight. People called uh, us at First Recon crazy for doing what we did. I mean, we go out there actively seeking, you know, seven men, and we'd walk into a base camp that had fifty, a hundred, hundred guys, you know, knowingly do it. Okay, they called us crazy for doing that. Okay, but we always knew we could depend on the OV-10s, we could depend on the Cobras, uh, fixed wings, and our 46s to come get it. We had brother, you know, we could call Big Brother and he'd come in and save us, you know. And they called us crazy for doing what we did. Well, we called these OV-10 people crazy, we called the Cobra pilots crazy, and we called the uh, 46 drivers crazy because they were crazy enough to come in and get us. And no matter what we was in, they always came. Not one time was a team left out there high and dry. I don't care how bad of, of contact you were in, somebody was there to get you out. I enjoyed the uh, OV-10 mainly because of uh, the reports that you heard of people that you helped out and uh, like put in a mission uh, for a guy one night and uh, he comes up on the radio and he goes, I don't know who you are, but if I ever run into you, he says, you won't buy a beer because you just saved my life. And that I would never have made it out of here alive if you wouldn't have been there. And you just listen to this time and again, and you go, that's, that really gives you a feeling of, of accomplishment and uh, knowing that if, if, you didn't, if you hadn't done something, these people probably would not be alive.
A number of years ago, I was in Duck, North Carolina on vacation with some neighbors of ours who have a house there. We're sitting in a restaurant at noon one day, and I'm wearing my OV-10 hat. The guy at the next table starts talking to his kid about, you know, that, that guy right there, you know. And that. He comes over and introduces himself and offers to buy me a drink. I never met him before anywhere. It happened to me, he was a recon marine and had OV-10s and had saved them a couple times out in the bush you know, with support to find them, get helicopters in and get them pulled out. brought their five aircraft in under an operation called Combat Bronco, and that had started in September of 1968. And the aircraft continued there. The Marines continued to operate their aircraft in Vietnam until uh, May of 1971. The Air Force continued their operations, and they actually kept them in Thailand uh, in the 1975-76 era before they left there. The, uh, the Navy also flew the Bronco in Vietnam. And that was a project that started to support the riverine warfare and the SEAL forces down in the southern part of South Vietnam in what we call the Delta area. Uh, they obtained 18 aircraft from the Marine Corps, from the Marine Corps inventories, and they were not using theirs as a forward air control aircraft at all. Their concept was to use it as a light attack aircraft, and that's exactly what they did with it in supporting the, uh, the folks down there. Their aircraft, the squadron was formed up in December of uh, 1968, in early 1969, in April, they moved in uh, to around the Saigon area and further south from there. And they operated up into early 1972, approximately April of 1972 was when they left country with their aircraft. The mission had gone, Vietnam was over, and there was no, really no mission for them to fly with it anymore. All their aircraft were turned back uh, to the Marine Corps and were flown. Some of them went to Okinawa to join the Marine Squadron up there. Uh, some of them came back to the United States. And in fact, I got to fly a couple of them from uh, North Island, uh, California, back up to Camp Pendleton when I was based there in 19, later in 1972. The OV-10 eventually went out with the Air Force because they, again, did not, just didn't find a further use for it. Even prior to the uh, Gulf War in 1991, they were already on their way out. Uh, the Marine Corps kept theirs. They did lose, we did lose two OV-10s in the Marines in the Gulf War. Two of them were shot down. Uh, but the Marine Corps, at the end of the Gulf War, uh, made a determination that they didn't think the OV-10 uh, was needed. They, they did use the statistics that of the 20 aircraft, two were lost, but at the same time they kept the Harrier, and many more Harriers were lost uh, in combat than OV-10s, road speaking. Uh, so they did decide, went back and talked to the ground troops and decided that they no longer could fill the role of the forward observation, uh, the observation aircraft and that, because of the supposed vulnerability. Today, I would guess that any of the, the Marines who have been over there, have been in the Marines for any number of years, who are operating in Iraq today, probably wish they had an aircraft like the OV-10. There just aren't enough Cobra helicopters to go around to do the type of mission over there, and they have other missions. And the, the light, uh, the support mission, the ground support mission that could be done by an OV-10 D-plus model or even an advanced G model, say, with uh, bigger, better engines on it and, and better equipment on it, it's just not there today. Uh, people are trying to reinvent the wheel on this, but it still goes back to we got rid of a good aircraft back in 1994. I was a maintenance avionics, airborne electronics maintenance officer on uh, basically F-4s, A-10s. Uh, did a lot of testing of missiles and stuff, but uh, I've been a hot rodder since I was 14 years old. I have built the, the hot rods all my life and in order to afford good paint jobs I had to learn how to paint. But I heard about the OV-10 Bronco Association uh, basically one Sunday I believe they had an article in the paper about the two OV-10s that they had brought in and I told my wife that hey I'd like to get involved in that you know airplanes, cars, hot rods, they all go together. So uh, I called and they said come on up and came up and next thing I know I'm the only guy that knows how to paint so my job is painting airplanes now.
come down with it. Oh, okay. As we come down. Let it roll down. Let it down. Let it down. Through the hole, Joe. Okay. Okay. Don't try this at all. Okay. Yeah. physically open these cowlings, it's a clamshell, they would rise up and, and hang. You check the engines, uh, fluids, leaks, make sure everything inside is operational. Batteries were inside here. Been, in, been inside this, this same airplane a thousand times, the batteries were in here. Engine up front. Pretty cool. Hydraulics in here. Hydraulic pumps. There's the oxygen. You'd have to check oxygen if you went over 24,000 feet. The pilots would have to have mask on and oxygen, so you check the oxygen levels. When we acquired this aircraft and brought it back, we had to reassemble it. It comes apart in in major structural pieces. You know, like the fuselage is one piece, the wing is one piece, and these booms are a pair of pieces with this uh, elevator across the top. That's the big tail piece. We reassembled that here, so I got to physically put my airplane back together. Each bolt, stick, it, stick them back in. And as it became alive again, after 40 years, I got to become alive again. We had heard the rumors about people getting spit at, and we were rotating back out of country. Uh, veterans would get off airplanes and walk through uh, airports in their uniforms, and protesters, and just people. Uh, And what's to say they weren't right, you know, trying to shut down the war would mistreat you. Plus, everybody kind of got the idea that because you had been in Vietnam, you were either a drug addict or somehow a little off your rocker, you know, a little bit like Rambo, run around with a knife in the woods or something stupid. So when I got back, um, Got on an airplane to come back to my hometown, did it in civilian clothes, uh, and for the next 30, almost 35 years, never told anybody I had been in the service or had been in Vietnam. When I found out about the OBA, came down straight away. I thought, golly, this is, this is too cool. I thought everybody had forgotten about the airplane and I hadn't thought about it in 30 years. I came down and found out that there were two or three guys down here, maybe four, that had a box full of goods and they wanted to do something. So 10 years ago, we started out in a gentleman named Mike Richardson's house with a box full of uh, books and pictures. I talked about it with several folks for years and finally tied up with Jim Hodson and, uh, and Ron Fix, who I'd known years before. And we finally got together and decided to do something about it. Well, we ought to put together an association. Uh, we did that jokingly and because most people had no experience with doing any of this and had no idea what it was going to grow into. And then when people could see what we had, they went to their garages and their attics and they started sending us box loads of old stuff. And so we started storing our things in our collection in a closet in the back of the building. Uh, after about a year of that, we decided the closet, we'd outgrown the closet and we had to do something else. And so the Vintage Flying Museum again 
uh, uh, rented out a small room for us. It's about, uh, I think it's about six by eight, so it's not very big at all, maybe four or 500 square feet. And so that was the first museum of the OV10 Bronco Association. The, the process of aircraft restoration here the way we do it, we refer to it as jungle maintenance uh, because we never have, I was a maintenance officer in the Marine Corps and we also used to harp on people that use the proper tool for the job. Here, all of those rules go out the window because we don't have the sophisticated slings and jigs and things like that to put airplanes back together. So what it becomes is a process of good old Yankee ingenuity and uh, we found out with the OV-10s, which we originally thought was going to be fairly an easy put back together because the airplane looks very simple. We found out it was really one of the harder airplanes that we've had to put back together. Oh, this has been a while. This has been a long time. The holes we've got here in the cockpit are only part of the process in making these airplanes flyable. Out of the 14 airplanes we have in the collection, the OV-10s are the only two that we can make airworthy again. But it's going to take a long time and a lot of money. We're going to have to overhaul the engines, which are probably going to be $80,000, $90,000 a piece to overhaul the engines. Uh, the cockpit is missing a lot of components. Those will have to be taken care of. We're missing components on the landing gear. Uh, and hydraulic pumps and things like that. So an estimate that we have is that to make either one of these air airplanes airworthy again will probably cost somewhere in the range of three to $500,000. And so we're a long way off from, from being able to do that. Uh, these airplanes will fly again sometime. I can tell you that just because of the heart that people have in this. Most of us are eternally grateful that there are people who are trying to uh, salvage some of these aircraft and uh, get them back in the flying shape and uh, save them. Otherwise, uh, there just weren't that many of them and they would have disappeared pretty quickly, particularly because they are still being used in some other countries who uh, are interested in rounding all of them up that they can for spare parts and to supplement their own fleets. So the fact that uh, we have two here at the museum is pretty special. One of the other things that, that a lot of people are interested in is what happened to the OV-10 uh, when the U.S. military quit using it. And a number of foreign countries have used the OV-10 for a number of years and continue to use them today in the attack role primarily. In other words, the role that was envisioned by Beckett and Rice way back in 1960. The other two biggest users are our government users, the U.S. government. The uh, Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, uh, has a number of aircraft, OV-10s, assigned to the California Department of Forestry. Department of Forestry uses them as spotter aircraft for fires. Almost a forward air control mission, and what they're doing is they know where the hot spots in the fires are, and the people they fly with a pilot and an observer, the observer directs the uh, aircraft, the fire bombers that are dropping the slurry mixtures and the water mixtures, and tells them where they need to go. Our State Department is using all of the Marine Corps OV-10Ds, D pluses that were left and they're using them for a different kind of mission uh, down in South America and they use those to spray cocaine crops. Uh, low altitude, uh, they've armored the aircraft with heavier armor than what we had on when we flew them and they've been flying that mission down there since uh, about 1995 or so. There are some civilian contractors who are looking at some ideas that could be used in Iraq to stop the, uh, the IEDs from, from killing Americans over there. And I know several different types of aircraft have been looked at. Um, there may have been some discussion on OV-10s being one of those. Problem with the OV-10 is they're just not available. They're being used by other, other groups. It's not that, like there are a bunch of OV-10s sitting out in the boneyard at Davis Monathan Air Force Base where they take all the planes when they're done using them. It's not that there are a lot of those available out there that could be used. Mm -hmm.